Hi, I'm Evity. And I'm Larry. And welcome to an Exact Science, investing in America's future innovators. That will be us. Hey, Evity. You know there's a lot of kids that I know that love science, but there's a whole lot more who don't like it. That's true. They think it's hard and don't even know why it matters. And it does matter, because science is in almost everything we feel, we hear, and we see. That's right, Larry. Science can be fun, too. We're here to show you how you can have fun and learn at the same time with science. On today's program, we're going to see what we as young people can do to help out the environment by learning about stern water runoff, rain gardens, and helping out the Chesapeake Bay. You'll also get to see us in an air pressure demonstration at the Maryland Science Center. That was a lot of fun. Oh, and you might want to get a pen and paper because there's a quiz at the end. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No quiz. Sit back and enjoy. Some Baltimore City public high school and middle school students got to explore the Patapsco River aboard the Chesapeake Bay Foundation Snow Goose on a trip hosted by Baltimore Inner City Outings. Inner City Outings is a nonprofit volunteer organization that gets inner city kids outdoors. And today we're out with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation aboard the Snow Goose, learning about the bay and the health of the bay and what we can do as citizens and students to make changes to the current status of the health of the bay. Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, is running this trip. And you know what? As an organization, we have a mission or a motto. It's three words. You might see it on a sticker. You might see it on my clothes. You might see it on Jocelyn's clothes. What are we trying to do? Three words. Save the bay. We're trying to save the bay. After introductions, students got to observe the inner harbor as the snow goose headed out toward the Francis Scott Key Bridge. So we started off our day with talking about the way that we use water and how that could potentially impact the Patapsco, which then has an impact on the Chesapeake Bay as a whole. So um, basically, things that happen on the land do come down to the river eventually, and it all impacts it. And that can have an effect on the biodiversity because it could kill off a certain type of plant that maybe one type of fish likes to eat. Do you all know what plankton is? Yes. Yeah, I do. What is it? It's yeah, it's bacteria. OK. How many of you have seen SpongeBob? Well, yeah. And you all know Plankton, the guy with the evil eye, I mean, well, the evil guy with the eye in the middle of his head? Yes. Okay. Well, he's actually based off of a real animal that's in the water called a copepod. Can you all say copepod? Copepod. Copepod. Now say it three times fast. Ready? Copepod. Copepod. Okay, well, that's, that's hard. Anyways, so copepods, they live in the water and they're called zooplankton because they're type of animal plankton. Oh, yeah, zooplankton. But there's also algae in the water called phytoplankton. So we're yes. going to put this in the water. This is a plankton net. And we're going to see if we can catch any plankton. While students waited for the plankton net to come back, they took a look at a map of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. This one is all about the bay 400 years ago. And who explored it? And then this is what it looks like today. So you can compare and contrast. Students then formed groups and did some mapping activities of their own. They were then told to think about and write down what they thought a watershed was. I want you to imagine that this is the wall of your bathtub. Maybe it's even the shower curtain, okay? If it rains, or if you turn on the faucet <coughs> in your shower, where does the rain or water in your shower go eventually? Down to the drain. It goes eventually down to the drain. Where do you think the drain is on this picture? Yeah, that's the yeah, the Chesapeake Bay or the Atlantic Ocean. So basically, if it rains anywhere in this green area, all that water goes down to the bay. That's the idea of the watershed. It's the land and the water that contribute to a body of water. After the net dragging for plankton was pulled in, students got a chance to observe their catch through a microscope. Now what we're going to do is we're actually going to take this bottle and we're going to get a sample from it and put it on this slide here. While some students looked for plankton, others got to touch jellyfish. So how do most fish breathe? They have gills. They have gills. So this guy doesn't have gills. They just take oxygen in through their cells. It'd be like if your mouth and nose were closed, you could breathe through your skin. Push it over the edge here. So just tilt it. Bye, jellyfish. There he goes. Now it was time to dredge for oysters. 
The exciting part is once we get them back to the boat, there's going to be a pile of oyster and shell and is that all that's on an oyster reef? No. What algae, else is on an oyster worm, reef? Algae. algae, worms, crabs. Is that what you said? Fish. So the, there could be fish. There's lots of other animals that live there. We're going to collect them all with that piece of equipment. When I say he, you say ho! He, ho! He, ho! When I say pull, you say harder! Pull! Harder! Pull! Harder! He, ho! He, ho! As students went through their catch, they learned how to tell if an oyster was alive or dead. If the shell was closed shut, it meant the oyster was alive. If the shell was open, it meant the oyster was dead. Is this one a live oyster? Yes. yes. It is. Now this is actually pretty cool. This is an oyster inside of a dead oyster shell, which is pretty neat. Now this one, is this one a live or dead one? Dead. Yeah. yeah, so for the dead oysters, guess what you get to do? You get to look at them, see if there's any organisms living on them, and throw it. And if there isn't anything that you really think that's too interesting, you're gonna gently drop it back onto the oyster reef. Yeah. Because that shell could one day be the home for another baby oysters, because baby oysters yeah. like to live on other oyster shells. Okay. Woo! Yeah. A net Woo! was also put out for catching fish, and it came back with some fish and crabs. He wet his hand. He gently went underneath of the fish. Has a raptor face. Does it look like Christian is squeezing him? No. Nope. No, he's gently holding, like a cradle almost. And you can use two hands if you like. And then he just gently lets him go. Give oh. Christian a round of applause. Thank you for this with Wi Fi. Like from back here. There you go. Perfect. So he can't reach you right there. And awesome. Good job. The instructors had a biodiversity board that listed the different species that were caught that day. Scientists use this method to see how the, the health of rivers, they do it all the time. We'll report this data uh, and hopefully it'll help people understand what's happening in the Tapasco. Yes. As the trip was coming to an end, students were asked what were some of the things they learned on the outing. I learned how to drive a boat. First, you gotta turn the, in the engine on Get on the stairwell, and you, the little lever you can push for how um, fast you can want the boat to go, and then you can just drive. Start recycling more, because when you don't recycle, and some of it just ends out in the bay, it makes the bay un unhealthy. We found out what kind of germs you can get if you swim in the Chesapeake Bay. It was awesome. It was learning about things that not everyone gets to learn about in an everyday setting. Um, just learning about how oysters and fish need to be taken care of just like us as humans need to be taken care of. So we, we got to talk a lot about biodiversity and why we really should care about having a lot of different types of species in the watershed and, and in the bay. Um, you can make a direct connection between the health of the watershed in the bay and the amount of biodiversity. So basically monoculture is bad, one organism is bad, lots of different things living is, is great and it's what we want. So hopefully that is what the kids take away, that there's, there's something that they can do every day to impact the health of the bay even if they're only one person. So that's, that's really the, the takeaway message that we're looking for. Up next, we're going to meet Ashley Trout, who works at Blue Water Baltimore. We met him at Ace Academy, where they dug up all the cement in their backyard and made out a huge garden. So one of the primary things that Blue Water Baltimore does is try to reduce stormwater runoff. Does that make sense? So it turns out that schools lend themselves really well, oftentimes, to large-scale projects where we can really make a difference on stormwater. So behind me right now, we're at the Academy for College and Career Exploration. Transformation School, who had been trying for several years to tear out roughly three quarters of an acre of parking lot that nobody parked in and none of the students came out and used for any, any real purpose. That space is what we're looking at behind us right now. This used to all be asphalt. 
as of about a year or a year and a half ago. The school had been trying for several years to pull up that asphalt. They partnered with Blue Water Baltimore. We secured a grant from the Chesapeake Bay Trust to come out here and tear it all up and transform it into green space. One, because we really want to reduce stormwater runoff. Two, because our urban schools, oftentimes you guys don't have a chance to get exposed to a positive outdoor green environment on a very regular basis. So now we've created three quarters of an acre of an outdoor classroom for the students to use. It looks like three different areas out here. Uh, what are they? Yeah, so there are actually three different areas out here. Uh, there's the rain garden that we were talking about. Then there's um, a flower garden predominantly over here and that the students put in on their own as, as part of one of their classes. They're growing flowers that they can cut and sell and things like that. They're also growing a few food crops. And then in the distance we've got pure food crops. And that was a partnership with the Baltimore Free Farm, which is an urban farm just down the road. They saw this new green space developing and they said, we would love to grow with your students. So now the students come out, grow with the farmers, learn about the crops, learn about where their food comes from and they can sell some of that food to the community and take some of the food into the school. Tastes good. So I think one of the, the, the take home points I want you guys to take with you is the idea that um, there are lots of opportunities to help protect our streams. It's great when we can do large scale projects like what you see behind us and there are a lot of opportunities for that, but small projects all over the place are equally important and that's the kind of stuff we need to be looking for. So at your school if you have a smaller space, you know, let's figure out what we can do there. But even beyond that, what can you do in your day-to-day -day lives? We learned a lot from Ashton. In fact, it inspired us to build a garden at our own school. People in the community, students, teachers, and employees from Domino Sugar all came together to do it and we had a good time. Honestly, I wouldn't think, you know, the community would like try to help the schools and around but you know it's, it's, it's really good to know that they want to help. I would hope that the students look at it as the community wants them to be a part of it. They want them to be engaged. Um, we want to help out with their education. Uh, they are our neighbors. You know, uh, Many of us live three, four, or five blocks away from school and see a lot of the kids every single day. So if there's a way we can help out we definitely want to take advantage of that. It was also cool to know that people in the community actually cared so much that they would actually come out and help. If you've never been to the Maryland Science Center, you have to go. There are so many cool exhibits and a lot of fun things to do. You can also get involved in different experiments that are going on at different times, like the one on air pressure that we did. Well, hello everyone. My name is Marion. Welcome to the Maryland Science Center. We're going to do a quick demonstration on air pressure. Now, raise your hand if you ever heard of air pressure before. How many of you have experienced air pressure before? Everybody should have their hands up, okay? You're experiencing air pressure right now, okay? On the count of three, I want you guys to take a deep breath and hold it, okay? One, two, three. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Let it out. Now, I will tell you almost 78% of the air you guys just breathe in is nitrogen gas. There's also oxygen and other things that make up our atmosphere, but there are chemicals, there are things, different gases that are in the air. And it looks like it's invisible, but you have to know that these different types of gases are there. And these gases exert forces on other things. It's exerting force on your body, it exerts force on this room, force on this building, forces on everything. So simply air pressure means the force that these gases, these molecules are applying to different things. What we have here are two regular old plungers. This one you can see completely solid, except our other one is a little different. Can you tell me the difference between the two of these? Just look right here on the base. No, one has a hole in it and the other one doesn't. All right. So when we talk about air pressure, just like everything in nature, there's a yin to every yang. Nature loves things to be balanced. Okay. Air is no exception. So what happens is that we have air pressure, all right, exerting a force on top of this plunger, inside of the plunger, in and out. What's going to happen is if I take it, and we'll use this table, I'm going to take this plunger, and I'm just going to slam it down on the table, like this. All right. Should I be able to pull it up pretty easy? No. no. Why? Because of all the air that, is, like, that was gone. Bingo, bingo, there's not as much air inside pushing up, right? So if I try to 
We'll get one of the big strong guys up here. See if you guys can do it. Just pull it out. Mm -hmm. All right, that was pretty strong, okay? It took a lot of muscle to be able to pull that out of there. That's because it's unbalanced. What do you think is going to be different now about the one that has a hole compared to this one? It's going to be easier to take out. It's going to be easier to take out because? Because air has, is getting into it. Bingo. It's like it, it has its own air, air hole now, so the air can easily get inside of it. So now if I put this down and that hole is there, okay, air is going to be able to still get inside of it, right? So now that's going to allow the air pressure inside. Air flow can still flow in. It's going to be pushing more upward. And, of course, the atmosphere is still pressing on the outside, but not nowhere near as much as the other one. Like I said, the atmosphere is putting 14.7 pounds per square inch on your body right now. But you don't feel it because your body is pressing against it. All right? So you don't really feel it too much or notice it too much. But you will after this experiment. What I'm going to do, I am going to take a volunteer, and I'm going to put them inside of this trash bag. Okay? I'm not going to say you're trash. I'm just saying I'm going to put you in the trash bag. All right? And what's going to happen is that I have a vacuum here. And the vacuum is going to suck all of the air out of the bag. I guarantee that if I put someone in here, okay, suck all of the air out, the person, we're going to see if we can get the person inside of the, the bag to dance. As the vacuum sucked the air out of the trash bag, participants found it difficult to move. All right, try to move around. Try to move around with that. Remove your fingers. Depending on their size, some felt more restricted than others. <laughs> that the atmosphere puts tons and tons and tons of pressure on you. But you don't really notice it because you're able to fight back. You're able to counterbalance that because your body can press against the atmosphere. We said the atmosphere puts how much? 14.7 14 .7 PSI, pounds per square inch on your body. And we can do really cool things with it. All right, so I hope you guys learned a lot and enjoyed it. Remember, science is cool. A group of students went on a weekend camping trip. They went biking, hiking, and kayaking. Students from Digital Harbor High School embarked on a venture to spend the weekend in Pocomoke State Park. They spent some time at school learning how to set up the tents they would be sleeping in. This exercise proved to be helpful for those who took the time to practice when they actually went on the trip. Where's the rain going to go if it's tight? Like down. Yeah, down and away from your tent. Right? Before the group left, they made a circle and talked about what they hoped to learn or do on the trip. My name is Kevin, and I am looking forward to fishing. My name is Pablo. I'm looking forward to go ah, kayaking. Kayak. I'm Miss Beltry, and I am looking forward to it not raining this weekend. <laughs> It took more than three hours to drive to Pocomoke, which included crossing the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. By the time they arrived at the park, night had fallen, and then it began to rain, which caused difficulty in setting up the tents. Make sure y'all clamp the uh, rain protector to the tent. The next morning, Students attempted to start a fire. While others prepared breakfast. Okay, then I'll get that. Do I combine the food together? You give us demonstrations. Yeah. For those who set up their tents properly, they had a good night's sleep. For those who didn't. Last night it was a little rainy storm, so a couple of the kids got, got wet, not put the tents together right, but uh, they're good, and uh, today it looks like the kids are about to go bike ride down. And uh, just today we might teach them how to bike ride, maybe canoe or we'll go fishing, whichever with the agenda, and uh, that's it. I already got this rock. I just found it on the trail. It's quartz. It's general quartz that you'll find in science class, everybody. I'm going to get this cut one day and put it on my high school ring. Students who wanted to go kayaking put on life jackets. Others jumped on bicycles to go riding. And a few went off to go fishing. Me and Fanta will be in the front. Jan's going to be in the back, kind of making sure we're all together. We're just going to go take a left out here and we'll circle around this island. Just always keep your life vest on. And yeah, we'll just, we'll just play around with it. If you have any questions, we'll, we'll give you some pointers on how to... I went kayaking for the first time today and it was so amazing. 
It was kind of shaky at first, but I got used to it and I was actually going fast. In addition to kayaking, biking, hiking, and fishing, folks got to enjoy the outdoor space by playing the ultimate Frisbee game. And another one called the tarp name game, where they had to try and identify who was on the other side of the tarp. One, two, three. Oh, no, I them. <laughs> <laughs> they also learned how to work cooperatively, especially in the dishwashing assembly line. Here we have Pablo and Devante on the first bucket. And what is in the first bucket? Soap. Soap. No, that's the first bucket. Oh, the first bucket, my bad. First Water. bucket is Water. Why? So they can just so the, the food, food comes off the food. and everything. Gotcha. Is going to be we got our bucket. Wash off, you take all my things away. <laughs> okay, after that, you're going to rinse it off. And after you put it in, you take everything out of soap. And you're going to put it in chloride to take the, kill all the bacteria. All right, so talk about the blue bucket. Like, it's bleach. Like we had to disinfect it because lots of people might have bacteria or viruses that could be spread it. Right. How much bleach? Mm -mm. Like one old tap. Tap full of yeah. bleach. Very good. And then what's going on down here? And they dry them. Drying. drying them off. And then what's going on over there to the left? I'm sorting them out. Good. Nice. Just the car. So there's lots of educational benefits, at least in my mind. A lot of kids had firsts. It's the first time that they've been away from home. It's the first time that they have put up a tent. It's the first time that they've been in a kayak. It's the first time that they've fished. Um, the first time that they have been outside for you know more than the time it takes to get to school or wait for the bus. They get to cook together. For, for a lot of students, they don't have that opportunity at home. Um, there's a good opportunity for different foods to eat. Very, very easy, simple things that I think a lot of people take for granted um, can all be considered educational and have a lot of educational value. <laughs> the last night of the trip, everyone sat around the campfire, singing songs and roasting marshmallows. Later, some dare to hike the Trail of Change. This is where the escaped slaves used to go. This is the route they used to take. They used to travel through the swamp land because they wouldn't get followed. And they would, and they would lose their dogs easy. And this is the trails that they, they used to run on the Appalachian Trail with the head off. This is just a historical site. I learned that when I was on my first Pokemon trip. So. The next morning, it was time to leave and head back to the city. People took the opportunity to reflect on their time camping out. <laughs> we have a dishwasher. <laughs> we can wash the We need a backup dishwasher. Uh, maybe I'll just wash the dishes for my grandmother more so her water bill won't be so high. <laughs> I learned how to listen more to hear everybody's backstories. Stop using flashlights like last night. That was just. I never knew that vision. I had like night vision. Like I could actually see like in the dark. I learned. Well, actually, coming here this weekend has been the best for me because I've been very stressed out. But since I came here, I've been more relaxed and more peaceful. So I learned that nature is best for me. Just being in the trees, the quiet, kayaking on the water, it's just so peaceful. So now that I know when something's wrong with me, just take a walk in the park and I'll be fine. So if we are conservative on all of our trips, um, that's two years that we can comfortably run outings like this, especially with all of the gear that we have, etc. Um, but it takes getting the word out to other people to volunteer and get certified, etc. So the more hands make light work. A real one. That looked like a lot of fun. I think I may want to try it. If I can get over the bugs, the snakes, and all the animals. Well, I wish I could have gone kayaking. But we're going to meet a real scientist named Ned Tillman. He wrote this book called The Chesapeake Watershed, A Sense of Place and a Call to Action. Ned Tillman is author of The Chesapeake Watershed, A Sense of Place and a Call to Action. He joined students from Digital Harbor High School on Federal Hill one morning to talk about his work in saving the bay. Well, it's usually the wind currents. Well, I, I was born here at Union Memorial Hospital. Anybody else born there? 
That's one of the main hospitals in Baltimore. And I was, that was in 1949, so I'm an old guy. Uh, so I've lived here all my life in and around the Bay, uh, sometimes in this area and sometimes in Pennsylvania. You know, but the Bay actually drains the water from six different states. Really? Yeah, isn't that amazing? The, the bay is the largest estuary in the United States. It's a huge body of water. And, and the rains that fall on New York State and West Virginia and Virginia, Pennsylvania, all drain down into the bay. It's a large area, yes. What can we do as teams to help clean up the bay? What advice do you have for us? Well, there is a great group in the city, two groups. One is the uh, uh, sustainable Baltimore group and they have a web page with a lot of good information and another is a nonprofit called uh, Blue Water Baltimore and both those are great resources for you to look at. Um, I think the thing to do is start realizing the three or four things that we all can do and then tell people about them. Certainly one is realize that we all generate a lot of waste and we got to be and we have to manage that somehow, so we, we can't just throw it out the window. We have to make sure it, it gets treated well. Second is plant as many trees as you can, if there's any chance to plant trees. Uh, because a tree is probably the most valuable resource we have for cleaning up the air and cleaning up the water. Uh, the third thing is, as you're talking about, is putting rain gardens in, if you can. And the fourth thing is just uh, Everybody needs to think about their consumption practices. We all like to buy stuff. But when we buy stuff, ends up there's some waste associated with, you know, the packaging or when it breaks, you get rid of it. So it's, it's always good. Whenever you spend any money at a store, always think of or always ask the question, is there, do I need it, first of all? And secondly, is this really the best product to buy? And I usually ask people, do you have a more sustainable product or do you have a more green option? It's not that I always have to buy the green option, but if we keep asking for it, guess what? The marketplace will make it. You know, if we all demand a better future, it will happen. If we demand better products, it will happen. So just think about your consumption product, you know, processes, what you buy, what you waste, and see if you're, you can change your behavior. Can you walk more? Can you buy less? Can you recycle more? Those are all important things to think about. Do you have like a group of people that you work with to like help others or inform people to like know that we're polluting the um, Chesapeake Bay? We kind of form an association, if you will, to, to help support each other and share ideas. But in, in Maryland, some of the larger groups like, would be like the Master Gardeners Association and this Master Naturalist. Uh, and there's also a whole range of environmental groups that care about the Bay. But it surprises me. A lot of people ask me to come speak to church groups or business groups. And it seems like the majority of people really care about these issues. And so it's probably one of the largest social movements of all time for people to finally realize we have to live in balance with the Bay, with the lawn, with nature. And so I have some hope there's enough people that, like you guys, that actually care about this, that we may all live our lives in a better way. I learned a lot from Mr. Tillman, and we'll be reading his book to learn even more. Like we kept hearing throughout the show, there are so many things we can do ourselves to help our environment, like putting trash in trash cans, recycling, and reusing. And even building gardens, which will not only help stormwater runoff, but give us fresh vegetables and beautiful flowers. We hope you learned something from our show and we hope you had fun. And keep a lookout for us and our friends as we bring you more exciting episodes of An Exact Science. Bye. Bye. I'm made of water, flowing water, sun and salt. Winds that blow Though my bones Were formed in the mountains It's through my blood This river flows Oh, driving down The wind will sound 